Okay, so we got uh, your exam one, test one for 1033C, intermediate algebra. Your exam is 20 questions, and this is what your 20 questions are going to look like. All we're basically going to do is change the numbers for show. So your first question is coming from that A2 section where it's all about compound inequalities. So that's where you dealt with ands and ors, okay? So the big thing in this one is notice that this guy is an and. So we'll talk about that soon enough. But the first thing that you got to do is you need to solve each one of these. Get the x by itself and tell us what each one of these inequalities equals. So for this first inequality right here, how do I get x by itself? That's right. We're going to add that 40 to both sides. Good. So plus 40 plus 40. So we got negative 5x less than 5. Because negative 35 plus 40 is 5. OK. Now what? Divide by what again? Negative 5. Yeah. Divide by the negative 5. So we got x. What is 5 divided by negative 5? Negative 1. Now, does the sign stay or does it flip? It flips. Yeah. Whenever this denominator right here, whenever that guy is negative and you're dealing with inequalities, flippy flippy. Okay? Whenever that denominator is negative and you're dealing with an inequality, you got to flip that sign. Okay? We don't care what the numerator is doing. Numerator can do anything. It's the denominator that dictates whether the sign flips or not. So now we know part of our answer here. X is greater than negative 1. So now we come over here and we solve the other inequality. We solve this second guy. So how do we solve it? Minus 10 on both sides. Yeah. Minus 10, minus 10. X is greater than or equal to negative 3. So now you got your answers. Again, in this question, though, it wants us to write the final answer as interval notation. So when I did this with my students, I made them draw a picture of the graph. Because if you know what the graph looks like, we can get the interval notation. Quick answer. Did we divide or multiply? Nope. Only when you divide by a negative or multiply by a negative. Most of the time for us, it's division. Okay? Yeah, you can add and subtract till the cows come home. Sign stays the same. So let's draw a quick picture of this. So we got our number line right here. Who is our lowest value up there? Negative 3. So that's going to be down here. Will it be a bracket or a parenthesis? at negative 3. It's going to be a bracket. And will it shade to the left or to the right? Which direction will that shade? To the right, because you, you can follow that arrow. The arrow is pointing the way for you. So this guy right here looks like that. That's what that answer looks like. Let's take a look at the other one. So. That means negative 1 is right here. Will it be a bracket or a parenthesis? Because it's not equal to. Okay, We only put the bracket when you see that line under it, and it's equal to. So this is definitely going to be a parenthesis. Will it show you to the right or to the left? Okay. To the right. Follow that arrow. Now we go back and we talk about this and. What does it mean when we are shading ands? What does it really want? Where they overlap, where they are in common. Most of the time with ands, that's in the middle. But that's not this case. Because where is it that I have an overlap of red and blue? Where would that occur at? Yeah, right here. That's where I would have both red and blue overlapping. 
because the blue shades here, and so does the red. So down here on my graph, will it be a bracket or a parenthesis here? It's going to be a parenthesis. It has to match what's above. Parenthesis, and it shades this direction. This is where our answer is going to be. That's the answer they want in interval notation, because this is where I have both the red and the blue at. Because ands, gosh, silly thing, ands want where there's overlap, where, they're, where they are in common. So what does this green shading right here look like in interval notation? Negative 1, good, to what? Infinity. Bracket or parenthesis at negative 1? Parenthesis, because it's got a match. And then in infinites always get parentheses. There's the final answer. Most of the time, and shade in the middle, but this is one of those special times where it's on the outside. And again, this is why I make my students draw the graph, because that graph looks pretty much like what it's talking about. That negative one has a parenthesis. And over here, I filled in the arrow, which means I'm going towards infinity. And it's on the positive side. What's your question? Correct. Because this arrow, that's where it's going towards all those positive numbers, right? You got it. That's positive infinity. Cool beans? Yeah, anytime one of these arrows gets filled in, that's an infinity. When you're going towards the left, that arrow would be the negative infinity. When you're going towards the right, that's the positive infinity. That's correct, Lorraine. All infinities get parentheses. Okay? All right, let's jump to the second one. So, and this one, this is coming from A1. This is your absolute values. Absolute values have how many answers? Two. So that means there are two equations here. Okay? Before you can make your equations, what? has to happen. You need to isolate it. We need to get this absolute value of x plus 5 by itself first. You need to isolate it. So how do I move a minus 4? Add it. So now we have the absolute value of x plus 5 equal to what? 21. Now that we have the absolute value isolated, we can make our two equations. Most of algebra students are really good at getting the first equation. It's the second one that usually trips us up. Okay? So the first equation is pretty straightforward. What are we going to do? Remove the brackets, or in other words, the absolute value signs. So First equation, all we do is drop the absolute value sign, and we can solve. We're really good at doing this guy and getting this answer. So how about we solve this? What would we do? Minus 5, minus 5. x equals, what's 21 minus 5? 16. There's one of our answers. And that's the one that, we, that I usually see. That's the one I usually get. It's the second one that often eludes us. The second equation, not too terribly hard to do. How do we get it? Yeah, you take the opposite of this side, and you still drop the absolute value. So to get that second equation, you do two things. Drop the absolute value, so you got x plus 5 and then give me the opposite, which is the negative 21. Drop and opposite. That's how you get the second one. Drop the absolute values. Give me the opposite. Yes. So what do we do to solve this? 
minus 5. Yeah, the same thing that you did to solve the first one is the same thing that you're going to do over here. The only difference is it's a negative 21 instead of positive 21. Minus 5, minus 5. x equals what? Negative 26. And now um, on your exam, both of you will probably be taking it in the computer, just like in your homework. It'll say x1 equals with a blank, x2 equals with a blank. And it tells you in the fine print that x1 is the smallest answer. So who is x1? The negative 26. That is the x1. That is the smallest answer that is up there. And you would put negative 26 in the first blank. And then this is your x2. Please make sure that you read that carefully. Make sure you put your numbers in the correct position. Because if you do not put them in the correct position, it will count it wrong. x1 is your smallest number. x2 is your larger number. You should have two answers, you bet. Because you're talking about the distance from zero. And there are, so if I am a distance of two away from zero, there's a distance above it that is two away. There's a distance below it that is two away. That's why there are two answers. Because I could go, I could put my car in drive and go forward a distance of two miles. I could put my car in drive and go backwards a distance of two miles. So there's two directions that you can go. OK? All right. Any questions on that one? Moving on up. So here we are talking about finding intercepts and then graphing it. So someone was, I think that was you. This is that 910 um, uh, skill for the tutoring. So those of you that were in tutoring or did tutoring or anything like that, this is that skill 9 and 10 from your tutoring session. Those of you that had to do it from the diagnostic, this is skill 9 and 10. So right here, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to find the intercepts. It's telling you exactly what to do. If I want to figure out x, I'm going to put what in for y? 0 in for y. So negative 3x plus I'm putting 0 in for y equal to 6. That's really what they want you to do. And what is this 0 really going to do to the 2? It's basically going to cancel it out. So really what you have left is a negative 3x equal to 6. Because that 0 in the y position just gets rid of it. It's gone. So how do I solve that? Divide by negative 3. Perfect. So what is 6 divided by negative 3? Negative 2. So there's the first box. Negative 2. Any questions so far? Cool. Then if you want to find the y-intercept, because that's the second one, we plug in what? The 0 for x. It's telling you to put in the 0 for x and then solve for y. So again, if I put in that 0, for the x, this is what it looks like. And what is that really going to do to the negative 3? It just cancels it out. It just gets rid of it. It's like it doesn't exist anymore. And all you're really left with is 2y equal to 6. Now what? Divide by 2. So there is your y-intercept, which is 6 divided by 2? 3. Now you know the number that goes in here. So you found an x-intercept, you found the y-intercept. All they want you to do for part B is you're going to graph this information. Now let me tell you how it's going to work on your exam if you're doing it on the computer. If, if you're not doing it on the computer, then ignore what I'm about to say. But on the computer, it gives you the graph, and then down below it gives you those little clear button, and then it's got the line button, the 
quadratic, uh, absolute value, the circle, and then a dot. It's got all those buttons down below. Close enough. It's something along those orders. I know the line is first and the dot is last. I can't remember the order of those guys in the middle. But it doesn't matter because we're not using those anyway. So what the directions say is it wants you to plot the intercepts and then draw the line. So you need to do three things on this. Okay, and if you do not do these three things, wrong. So the first thing you're going to do is plot the intercepts. That means we just want to put our two dots on for these guys. So that means you're going to choose the dot tool first. Okay? So we'll come up here and we're going to plot negative 2 comma 0. So negative 2 comma 0. You put your cursor right there, make a dot. And then you'll plot 0, 3. Put your cursor at 0, 3, make a dot. And then the second thing you're going to do is now we need to connect them. So you choose the line tool because you are drawing a line. OK? So this is the third thing you're going to do. You've already done the first two. You made a dot. You made a dot. Now you just take your cursor, put it in the middle of your dot. And then as you move that cursor away, your line forms. And then you come up here and you put the, the cursor in the middle of that. And it makes your line and solidifies it. So you have to do those three things. You put your dot, you put your dot, then you choose the line tool, you put your dot on, as soon as you move away it makes a line, and you go up and put the second dot in. So you have to take these and then take the second one? Yep. So when you're making your line, you'll click it in here. As you move away, it makes your line, you'll see it appearing, and wherever your cursor goes that line will go and then you click it a second time to finally put the line in. I kept doing that long, but it was like 0.9 out of 10, right? Yeah. It's very picky. It is very, very picky. So when you are doing this also on that exam, please try to be as in the middle of those dots as possible. It is very, very fickle, OK? It wants you to be exact. So that's how this will work if you're doing it on the computer. Obviously, if you're doing it by hand, you don't have to make all those extra things. You just got to draw the line. OK? And that's exactly what you did if you were doing the review for the diagnostic on 9 and 10. These were the questions that were right up above. And then at the bottom, there were two graphing. That's exactly what you guys had to do in your diagnostic for 9 and 10. Cool beans? All right. So there's that guy. All right, so now, <coughs> now we're going to write the equation. OK, that's what we're getting to here. So the first thing they want you to do is take this equation that they give you right here and turn it into slope intercept. They want to know the m and they want to know the b. So if you were one of my students, I taught you two ways to do this. You can convert it by solving for y. And those of you that did, again, the tutoring for the diagnostic, this was skill number seven, where you had to solve for y on all five of those problems. This was skill number seven. And those of you that had me as a professor, um, I taught you also another way to do this, which is formulas. I'm going to show both. If you don't understand what I mean by formulas, ignore what I'm about to say after that, OK? But most of you, your professor probably said, hey, Go ahead and convert this. Get the y variable by itself. So let's talk about how we do that. What are we going to do first? Add the 2x to both sides. That's right. We've got to pick up the x. We've got to move it away from the y. So plus the 2x to both sides. And now you've got this negative 6 and this plus 2x. Do those two get together? No, they don't like each other. They don't like each other. Don't put them together. So you have an option of how you can write this. Most of the time, I'm going to put the x first and then the other number. So I'll write it like this. 2x minus 6. 
That's how I will generally rewrite it because I like to put it in that mx plus b form. But there is nothing wrong with putting it like this. Negative 6 plus 2x. There is nothing wrong with that. It is a okay. You just got to remember who is who in the end. Okay? No, you can put it either way. Well, but you kept the negative 9y plus 2x on the same side. Right. You got to move it to the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to pick it up and you got to move it to the other side of the equal sign. Because you still have it right there by the y. We don't want that. We need it on the other side. All right, so what do we do now to get the y by itself? There's only one more step. Yeah. And for my students, I don't like to come over here and do that. I don't like that. I, uh, uh, to me, that bugs me a lot. So what I told my students, and it's just a small little change, all I told them to do is whatever you're going to divide by, just divide the numbers by it. The 2 gets divided by negative 9. And the 6 gets divided by a negative 9. I separate them out because that's really what's going on. That's really what you need to do. Okay, and again, over here, the same thing would happen. Divide by negative 9, divide by negative 9, divide the 2 by the negative 9. And here, all you do now is reduce your fractions. Now, I know some of you get really, really scared when you see fractions. So the good thing is to know that on this test, you get a calculator, right? You know that you have a fraction key on here, right? Where is your best friend at, the fraction key? How do I get to that? Alpha y equals. And all you got to do to reduce your fractions is just put them in. So my first fraction was 2 over a negative 9. I hit enter, and there's my reduced fraction. It's negative 2 ninths. My second fraction hit alpha y equals, and we're always working with the first one, was negative 6 not 0 0.6, negative 6. Oh, let's just clear that up. Alpha y equals negative 6 over a negative 9. There's the second fraction. Notice it got reduced to 2 thirds. It's OK. Alpha y equals, and you hit enter for the first guy. If you got an error, it's because you probably pushed the minus. You need to push the negative button. There is a difference between the negative and the minus. See the difference in symbols? The first symbol you see is the negative. The second symbol you see is the minus. You need to push the negative button. And so you should get two-thirds for that. OK? So again, how did I make my equations? So I push negative 6, and then I scroll down, and I push negative 9, and then I just, oops, not 6 again, 9, and I just hit Enter. And it should kick it out. Alpha y equals. Hit enter. Hit enter. Now put in your fraction. Scroll down. Negative 9. Enter. And so we just go back to our equation now and we write it out. So y equals the 2 over negative 9 did not reduce, so it's negative 2 ninths x. The negative 6 over the negative 9 became a positive 2 thirds. There's your equation. Or if you did the other guy, it would look like this. y equals 2 thirds minus 2 ninths x. 
So in this problem, they want to know who is M. The negative two ninths. That's your slope. Then the two thirds is who then? That's your B. That's the Y intercept. But they will want the Y intercept in this form. So they want it written as a point. So it would be 0, comma, 2 thirds. That's what they want for the B. And the M, as you told me, was negative 2 ninths. Now, those of you that have me as students, there was a second way I showed you, which was a formula. We could easily get the answers to this guy with a formula. Sorry, let me scroll back down. Everyone good on this one so far? So those of you that have me, we could easily do a quick formula on this, because since we are in standard form, I can show you how to get to your answers real, real fast without having to do all the converting. So the formula for the slope was the opposite of A over B. The formula for the intercept was C over B. Now these A, Bs, and Cs, they just come from your coefficients. The A is always in front of X. The B is always in front of the Y. The C is always by itself. So all you have to do is plug in the numbers and reduce them. So this guy says the opposite of A. My A over here is negative 2. What's the opposite of a negative? Positive. And then it says, give me the B value. My B is negative 9. There's the slope that we came up with down below. The C. Here is my C value, negative 6. And again, the B value was a negative 9. And we know that that reduces to 2 thirds. Now you know M. Now you know the B. You just got to write it up in the proper form. So you can use formulas if you want, or you have the convert way. Your call, all the same. But the formula only works if you're in standard form. X and Y have to be on the same side. OK. Next one. Write the equation again. But this time, you have two points. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to use that slope formula. That slope formula is? y2 minus y1, then what? Over x2 minus x1. I also told my students that you could also do y1 minus y2 divided by x1 minus x2. Both of these work the same way. I usually use the second one because I like to work left to right. But it's your call. They're both the same formula. And also, before I do this problem, I take the 2.5 seconds to label my points. Who is the negative 4? That is x1. The negative 2? y1. The 3? There we go. So I take the 2.5 seconds to do that, because now I know exactly where they all go in my formula. So if I plug in. Who is y2? Negative 1. Minus, who is your y1? Negative 2. And you need both of those. You need the minus, the first one, because of the formula. And you need the second one because that was the number. You need both. Who is x1? Or sorry, x2, because I started with y2. 3 minus x1. Negative 4. And you better believe on your test, we're going to be making some of these negative, so you have to adjust for that because of the formula. Because that's where some of our students run into trouble. Because they see a negative number and the formula has a minus, and you think they're both the same thing. And they drop one of the symbols. Don't do that. 
What happens with two negatives by each other? Positive. So really what we have up on top is negative 1 plus 2. And on bottom we have 3 plus 4. So what is negative 1 plus 2? 1. What is 3 plus 4? There's our slope. There's our slope. Now what are we going to do? Because there's two ways you can go at this. And I'm not sure what way some of your other professors taught you. I know the way that I taught. We're going to plug the numbers into the formula. All right, so uh, Lorraine sees this formula. And you can plug numbers into that and absolutely get that. That's not the way I taught it, but that's how some of you probably learned it. So what you need to do is we're going to plug in the M, but you have two points. How many do you need? Just one of them. Yeah, you got to pick one. No matter what, from here through the end, you got to pick one of those two points. OK? So do you want to work with the negative 4, negative 2, or the 3, negative 1? 3, negative 1 sounds fine. So we're going to work with those two guys right there. It doesn't matter which point you pick. You're going to get the same answer. And that's how I teach it. Correct. There's two ways you can go about this. Because the thing is, is we have the slope. The only thing we're missing is the B. Okay? So we can plug into this using that point we chose and the slope and figure out what B is. Or what you just gave me, which was called point slope. Y minus Y1 equals M parenthesis X minus X1. And that will just take us straight to the answer as well, too. Both of these are valid methods. I taught the y minus the y1. Some of you know that you can plug into this and solve for b and then rewrite your equation. So I'm going to finish up with the green here, and then we'll talk about the red, because that's how I taught was doing the red. All right, so again, let's plug in our point. What was the y value from our point? Negative 1. So we got negative 1 here. Equals, what was our m? One seventh. What was the x value from the point? Three. And then plus b, because we don't know what b is. So now we need to do some multiplying and then some adding and subtracting. So the first thing we're going to do is multiply the one seventh times the three. Again, if you don't know how to multiply fractions, jump into your calculator. Alpha y equals, and we're putting in 1 over, yep, let me get there, 1 over 7. And we're going to multiply that by what number? Three. Times 3. Hit enter, and there's your number. 1 7 times 3 is 3 7 so jumping back, so now we have negative 1 equals 3 sevenths plus b. Now how do I get that b by itself? What are we going to do next? Subtract the 3 sevenths. Minus 3 sevenths minus 3 sevenths. So now, again, we're just going to go right back to our calculator, because I know we hate adding and subtracting fractions, especially when they don't have common denominators. And we're going to take negative 1 minus 3 sevenths. Negative 1 minus, and here's the cool thing. We want to use this fraction right there. So just scroll right back up to it and hit Enter, and it drags it right down. Or you can do your alpha y equals and put 3 sevenths back in. Either way. Nope, that's not a fraction. It's just negative 1. And so hit enter, and there's our new fraction. There's what b equals. b equals negative 10 over 7. So negative 10 over 7. 
but you're not done. And this is why I don't like to go through this, because some people will solve for B, and then they'll think that they're done. But you're not done. You have to rewrite the equation. We need to plug in the M and the B. So the final answer to this is Y equals, what was your M? One-seventh. X, what's the B? Negative 10 over 7. That's the final answer. You have to rewrite the equation with your M and your B. I don't like to do that method because, again, some people, once they figure out what B is, they think that they're done and they stop. I like to do the point slope because once I get to the end of that, that is the answer. The three sevenths? Well, because one seven times three is three sevenths, and then I have to move this to the other side. So how do you get rid of a positive three sevenths? Subtract three sevenths. So that's my subtraction step. Over here, you won't see that. So over here, we're going to get the same answer. Y minus, what was your Y1 from that point? Negative 2, nope, the point that we highlighted. Negative 1. So we got minus 1 equals, what's our M? 1 seventh, parenthesis, X minus, what is our X from the point? 3 because that's the point that we chose. So we plugged in. OK. What happens with two negatives by each other? Positive. So we know that this is y plus 1. And then what are we going to do with this 1 7 Distribute it. So what's 1 7 times x? And we already know this one. What's 1 7 times a negative 3? Negative three-sevenths, because we just did that a second ago, where we took the one-seventh times the three. And then now, you only got one more thing to do. We got to get the y by itself, so what do we do? Subtract one. And we already did this combination. We already know what negative three-sevenths minus one is. y equals one-seventh x minus ten-sevenths. There it is. That's why I like to go with the route of the red, because when I finish, that is my answer. I don't have to do any rewriting. But it's whatever you choose to do. If you like plugging into slope intercept and solving for B and then rewriting, knock yourself out. If you like using point slope, use point slope. Both get you the same answer. Any questions? over this one. The most important po part of this, in the beginning, you got to find the slope. And then once you know the slope, you pick a point and you write your equation. Find that slope first, and then pick one of those two points and go about writing your equation. Excuse me. Any question on number five? And you're going to do this same idea again later on. It'll be a word problem style, though. The same thing is going to hit you again. What's up? My problem is if when you're asking <coughs> the question, you're remembering what step that you're doing. Yeah. Yep, yep. I get it. I get it. So this one. In my class, I, when I went through it with my students, you know, this looks like a giant word problem. So with my students, I'm like, I'm like, this is not a word problem. We just need to get the information out of it, OK? All this is is a write the equation problem. But the thing that you got to deal with in this one is this parallel and this equation that they give you right here, OK? So let's talk about this. How I talk with my students is I say, this really is this problem is about a line one, some sort of relationship with a line two. This is all about two lines. That's what this problem is about. 
under line one is the equation. Under line one goes the equation they give you. Under the relationship, well, up there you can see that it's in bold. It'll either be parallel or perpendicular. That's what goes under my R, the relationship. And in this one, they are parallel. And that's the symbol for parallel. If it was perpendicular, I'd draw an upside down T under there. Okay? Under line two goes the point. And that's how I always attack this problem. I set it up. I get rid of all that extra information up there. Under line one, I put my equation. Under the relationship, I put parallel or perpendicular. Under line two, I put the point. Helps me organize my information. And then all I'm going to do is work this problem from left to the right. The only thing line one is good for is its what? You want to find its slope. Because the slope of this, line one, affects the slope of line two through the relationship. So the only thing that line one is good for is finding its slope. And earlier, we found slope two different ways with this. You can get the y by itself by converting. Or you can run the formula. And that's why I teach the formula. Because all I really need out of this is the slope. If you know the formula, then you can jump to the, the, to the slope right away with very little work. But let's show both of it anyway. So if I convert, how do I start to get the y by itself? That's right. Add the 12x. Come on. So that gives me negative 3y equal to what? 12x plus 9. I like that version. But you could also have the 9 plus the 12x. It's your call. I'm going to leave it as 12x plus 9. Now what do we do? Divide by the negative 3. And I only divide my numbers. So y equals, what is 12 divided by negative 3? Negative 4. Good. X, and what's 9 divided by negative 3? Negative 3. And now you know the slope of line 1. What is it? It is negative 4. The slope of line 1 is negative 4. If you did the formula, the formula is the opposite of A over B. So if I go back up to the original equation, the 12 is my A position. The negative 3 is my B. The 9 is the C. So the formula down here is the opposite of A over B. My A is negative 12. So what's the opposite of a negative 12? Positive 12. Good. My B up here is a negative 3. So I plug that in down here. And what's 12 divided by negative 3? Negative 4. It is so much faster than converting. But it's your call on what you want to do. Some people have to convert. Some people, the formula is just, woo, right over their heads. And that's OK. I mean, yeah, you need that slope. Without it, you can't write the equation. So now we use that relationship. That's why I set this up. Like I said, I work left to right. So I've dealt with the line 1. Now I need to use this relationship. Because that's going to tell me what the slope of line 2 is. So that's what this second piece is going to do. I need this slope, negative 4. I need to know what is the slope that is parallel to it. So what's a parallel slope to negative 4? A negative 4. Remember, parallel slopes have to be the same, the exact same number. Since line 1 is negative 4 and we're parallel, line 2 has to be negative 4. What does it take to be perpendicular? Opposite and flip it. That's the opposite. Opposite means change the sign. 
and reciprocal means to flip it. So the perpendicular slope, if we needed it, would have been 1 fourth. Because remember, this negative 4 is over a 1. So the opposite of a negative is a positive. Flipping that would be 1 over 4. So if we needed the perpendicular one, it would be 1 fourth. So remember, parallel slopes, the exact same. Perpendicular slopes, change the sign, flip it. You need to do both. Change the sign, flip it for a perpendicular slope. We call that opposite reciprocals. All right. And now you have enough information to write the equation. And you can write it the same way that we just did a second ago. You can plug in the point slope. Or you can plug into slope intercept, solve for b, and then rewrite. I'm going to plug in the point slope, because that's really how our book taught us. So y minus y1 equals m parenthesis x minus x1. y minus, what's y1? Negative 8. Equals, what's your m? Negative 4. x minus, what's x1? 1. All right. So we're going to distribute through our parentheses. And what happens with two negatives by each other? Positive. So we got y plus 8 equals, what's negative 4 times x? Perfect. And what's a negative 4 times a negative 1? Positive 4. Right on. And now what are we going to do? Subtract 8 from both sides. And whenever you move this last number, it always goes with the last number over there. Don't put it with the x. So y equals negative 4x what? Minus 4, or negative 4. They both mean the same thing. There's the equation. Yes? Can I do it the other way? Absolutely. Sure. So if you want to plug into slope intercept, but before I get to that, any questions on this one real quick? Yes? Oh, I'm not switching the page. I'm just going to, I want to scroll down a little bit. Feel free to take that table and scoot it this way. You don't have to be so far away. Everyone have everything written down that they need? All right. So if we did slope intercept, that means we're going to plug into this, and we're going to solve for b. So our y value was negative 8 equal to our slope was negative 4. Our x value was a 1 and then plus b. So what's negative 4 times 1? Negative 4 plus b. I need to take this negative 4, move it to the other side. So how do I get rid of a negative 4? Add 4. So negative 4 is equal to b. And now make sure that you rewrite your equation, which will look just like what I have right there in green. Y equals negative 4x minus 4. OK? Any questions so far? I do have worked out solutions for all these. Um, and I do show all the different methods. So and that solution guide will be posted out there along with the video. Today, there will be a link. And hopefully your professor will provide you that link. I will put my link in my announcements in Canvas. Oh, they're gonna get they're, they're all gonna get emailed from me, that link. So yeah, they'll have it. I'm Professor Armstrong. Any questions so far? Feel good? Rocking and rolling. Again, this is like the long part of your entire test. Once we get past this, it will start speeding up around like question 10. Okay, this is where you get hit with all the like a lot of work and things like that. So this guy, it's asking that question, are we parallel, perpendicular, or neither? In order to tell if you're parallel, perpendicular, or neither, what do you need to know? The slopes. So that's the thing you're going to have to do. And that's what part A wants. 
we're going to figure out the slope of line 1. We're going to figure out the slope of line 2. We, this is the third time you have to find a slope. That's right. Line, line 2 is already ready to go. What is the slope of line 2? It's 1 6. It's right here. This is in y equals mx plus b. But line 1 is not. It, that's why I'm saying this is the third time you're going to find slope. You can either convert it or you can run your formula. Again, since you only need the slope, using that formula is actually pretty quick for this. But I'm going to show both ways. So we've got 12y plus, or sorry, 2y plus 12x equal to 16. How do I start to get the y by itself? You subtract 12x because it's plus. So subtract 12x minus 12x. And so that gives me 2y equal to what? There you go, negative 12x plus 16. Again, you could have 16 minus 12x if you want to write it like that. And now what are we going to do? Divide every number by dose, 2. So what's negative 12 divided by 2? Negative 6x. And what's 16 divided by 2? 8. What's the slope of line 1? Negative 6. Again, if you use the formula, m equals the opposite of a over b, be careful on this one, because this 2, that represents b, because b is always with the y. a is always with the x, and c is always the guy that's no, no variable. It's a loner. So my a up here is 12. What's the opposite of a positive 12? My b up here is a 2. So we slap that down below. And what is negative 12 divided by 2? Negative 6, the same slope that we ended up with. So now that we have the two slopes, and that's the answer to part A, so there'll be a blank for line 1 saying, what's the slope? So you put negative 6. There'll be a blank for line 2 saying, what's the slope? You put 1 sixth. According to this, are we parallel, perpendicular, or neither? We are perpendicular because we are opposite reciprocals. One is negative. The other one is positive. There's your opposite. And they are reciprocals because what number is under the 6? There's a 1 here. So if you flip that, that's 1 sixth. So down here in part B, you would circle B because they're perpendicular. Cool beans? All right, numero eight. Like I said, this is where we're going to start to get a little bit faster. All it wants to know, is this a function? So what do you think? No, why? Really? I don't see a negative 13 twice. It is a function. Because every x value has one and only one y value. Or how I talk to my students, your x's aren't cheating. There is no repeating x. Your x's don't cheat. Because 13 only happens once. 1 only happens once. Negative 13 only happens once. The 15 only happens once. The 6 only happens once. Yes, this is a function. We don't care about the y's. The y's can do whatever they want. They can cheat all they want. They can go to multiple x's. It's the x's that we care about. X's don't cheat. They get one and only one y value. OK. The next one, again, still talking about is it a function. But now I'm giving you graphs. How do we tell if a graph is a function? Vertical line test. Remember, vertical line test says draw on as many vertical lines as you want. As long as you hit it only once for every vertical line, you're a function. So that means if we hit it two or more times, x's are cheating. No go. Not a function. So A, is that a function? Yes. yes absolutely. Because if I draw a vertical line, I only hit it once. Draw a vertical line, I'll 
All these vertical lines are only hidden at once. B, function? Yes. yes. Even though it looks like it goes vertical right in here, it's, it, it's actually still separating itself out. So anywhere I draw a vertical line, even right there, I'm only hitting it once. So yes, B is a function. C, function? No. Nope. Because right here, if I draw on a vertical line, bad news bears. I'm hitting it twice. That X is cheating. OK? What about D, function? Absolutely. Because even down here, I'm only going to hit it once, 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 function. E, is it a function? That one's confusing. But again, you got your vertical line test. If I draw on vertical lines, will I only hit it once? You bet. If I draw on right here, and it looks like it's going to go straight up, but it's not. It's still going out. So even right there, I'm only hitting it once. I'm only hitting it once, 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 once. Everywhere you draw a vertical line, you're only going to hit it once. So this guy is definitely a function. What about F? Yeah, no go on that guy. Circles, ovals are never going to be functions. Because right there, I've just shown you, I've got an x that's cheating. So there were four functions. And again, on your test, you would mark the boxes for those. All four boxes would have check marks because there's more than one answer. More than one answer. The only ones that weren't were C and F. Shame on them for having cheating nexus. OK. Now this one right here, we're talking about this function notation. What do they want us to do with this negative 3? Yeah, substitute it in for x. Plug it in. Plug it in. Plug it in. Anywhere where you see an x, you put a negative 3. So f of negative 3 really looks like this. 7. Oh, I see an x. I'm going to put a negative 3, and we're going to square it. Plus, I see a 3. Oh, there's an x. I put in negative 3, and then minus 2. That's what it looks like. All I did was plug in. Those of you that did that diagnostic tutoring, this is what you did on skill 3 and 4. This is what you did on skill 3 and 4. We told you what x was, and you had to plug it in. And then now, you do skill 1, which is order of operations. Right here, you're doing skill 3 and 4, and you're doing skill 1, because now you do order of operations. Order of operations says we do parentheses exponents first. So that means I need to take this negative 3 and square it first. If you took the 7 times the negative 3, you are doing order of operations incorrectly. You need to take the negative 3 and square it first. What is negative 3 squared? 9. So I got 7 times 9. And again, so you always know this and remember this. Anytime you square a number, I don't care what that calculator says, it's always positive. Any number squared is always positive. Drill that into your brain, tattoo it on your arm, whatever you need. Okay? Any negative number or any number to a power of 2 will always be positive, no matter what the calculator says. I don't care what it says. It's always positive. Plus 3 times negative 3 minus 2. So we took care of our square. And then now order of operations says multiplication and division. Do we have multiplication and division? So we work from left to right. What's 7 times 9? 63. What is 3 times negative 3? Negative 9 minus 2. And then now, last but not least, adding and subtracting. Do we got that? Absolutely. Left to right. What is 63 minus 9? 54. What's 54 minus 2? There's your final answer. Answer is 52. Get that out of the way. Does that make sense? You plug in, and then you run some PIM dossier. Plug it in, plug it in. Question 11. So here, and for the next three questions, how I know it's the next three questions, it says it right there. And it's bold and underlined. For the next three questions, we are finding domain. And you need to write it in interval notation. OK? So that's bracket parentheses, might be some infinities, things like that. 
So up here, we've got this function. So remember, in the beginning, your domain is always what? All reals. In the beginning, your domain is always all reals, negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay? Unless we run into two specific cases. One of those cases is irrational. Remember, the rationals look like fractions. Okay? You have a variable and a denominator. Does this look like a fraction, a variable and a denominator? No. That would look like question number 13. See how you have a variable and a denominator? This is what we call a rational. Okay? But question number 11 does not look like that. So right now our domain is still what? All reals. Negative infinity to positive infinity. And then there's another guy that creates a problem for us. And that is the radical function, the root function. Does this look like it has a radical in it? No. That would look like number 12. That's a radical function. That's a root function. And number 11 does not look like that. So what's the domain? All real numbers. If you are not one of those two cases I just showed you, every time, all real numbers. That's your domain. That's the answer. It, it, this is not exactly linear, but we call these a polynomial. Anytime you have a polynomial, it's all reals. Everyone good so far? Okay. Now, number 12 and 13, these are those cases that we we're talking about. Who is this? Is this rational or is this a radical? This is your radical. Okay. What do we do with the piece under the radical? Not equal to zero, but a little bit more. Say it louder. Greater than or equal to zero. This is the one that it's greater than or equal to zero. Because under the radical, we can only have positive numbers, which is the greater than part. And or we could be zero, which is why we have the equal to part. So we need to solve this. What do we do first? Add 8 on both sides. Plus 8. Plus 8. So again, kind of to talk about what we just, we just discussed, whenever it's a root, a radical, you set it greater than or equal to 0. So we got negative 3x greater than or equal to, what's 0 plus 8? Eight? 8. And now what? Divide by negative 3, divide by negative 3, x. Flip the sign. Good, because you see that that denominator's negative. So it's less than or equal to. Does 8 over negative 3 reduce? No, it doesn't. Again, if you don't know, go to your handy-dandy calculator. Alpha y equals 8 over a negative 3. Nope, doesn't reduce. Stays negative 8 over 3. They do not want decimals. There's only one problem in here that they will allow you to have decimals. And this ain't it. So we have this. We just need to take this answer and put it as interval notation. Yes, I can. There's the whole problem. <coughs> so if we draw a quick picture of this, put a little number line, so that way we can visualize this. Right here, this is at negative 8 thirds. Is it a bracket or a parenthesis? It's a bracket because we're equal to. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're equal to. Are we going to shade to the left or to the right? To the left. Follow that arrow. So this is what it looks like. And we talked about this earlier with number one. How does this look interval notation wise? What does this arrow right here being shaded in mean? Negative what? Negative infinity. And we're going up to what number? Negative 8 thirds. So parenthesis at the negative infinity or bracket? Parenthesis, because infinities are always parentheses. 
Bracket or parenthesis at the negative 8 thirds? Bracket. See how it matches my graph? It looks just like it. That's the interval notation that they want. That's called interval notation. Brackets, parentheses, infinities, numbers. OK? All right, one more domain. And this guy is which kind of function? It's the rational one. So in the rational one, all we're going to do is take this 2t minus 34 and set it what? This is the one that's equal to 0. Yep. So we're going to take 2t minus 34, set it equal to 0. We don't care about the numerator. It's the denominator that we care about. That's where we have the problem at. So don't worry about the numerator on this. The numerator can do whatever it wants. It's the denominator. And we set it equal to 0, and all we got to do is solve. So what are we going to do now? Add 34 on the other side. Absolutely. Plus 34. So 2t equals, what's 0 plus 34? 34. All right. Now what? Boom. Divide by 2. Divide by 2. t is equal to, what is? OK. 34 divided by 2 is 17. So now let's talk about this as interval notation. This is the number that causes problems for us. Unlike what you just saw in number 12, this was the answer. This, these were the good numbers. But in number 13, in this case, this is a bad number. We don't like this one because this is the one that makes the denominator up here 0. And when you go into the calculator, whatever number you try and divide by 0, the calculator says error. Okay, so this is a bad number. This is the number that we want to throw out. We're going to invite everybody to the party but this number. So how we write that as interval notation, it looks like the or answer that you had when you learned about compound inequalities. It's going to have the union. So again, we're inviting everybody to the party. So that means we're inviting negative infinity all the way up to this number. And then we're going to union that with the other side of the number on to positive infinity. Again, it looks like the or answer from when you did A2. You got negative infinity to 17, and it's a parenthesis. Whoa, coming back. And it's a parenthesis. Union, parenthesis, 17 on up to positive infinity. All of these will be parentheses in this. You will never, ever have a bracket. I have an answer. Going back to number 12. <clears throat> well, in this, when, whenever we begin this, you always set it greater than or equal to 0. Always on the radical, you're going to use greater than or equal to 0. The reason why it became less than is because we divided by a negative. That's what happened. That's where the less than came from. But this will always be greater than or equal to 0. When it's the rational one, it's always equal 0. When it's the fraction-looking one, you always set it equal to 0. It's the radical one that it's greater than or equal to 0. And if you've noticed, in the ones that had inequalities, they had some sort of negative number that made you flip the sign. You better believe it's coming at you on this exam. That there will be some time in there where you will divide by a negative number, and you must flip that sign. I guarantee it. It might be on question 1. It might be on question 12 because those are the ones where we hit inequalities. OK? Yep. Number 13. There was. <clears throat> yeah, any number divided by 0 in the calculator, you'll get an error. That's why I'm saying that the numerator can do whatever it wants. Yes. 
That's why we set the, the denominator equal to 0, because we want to find out when are we going to get that problem. So 17 is when you have that problem. 17 is what creates the 0 in the denominator. OK? Everyone good? All righty, moving on. We're almost there. <coughs> so they're going to give you a picture of a line. And they want to know, is that a positive slope, a negative slope, a zero slope, or an undefined slope? So what kind of slope is that? It is undefined. That's right, because all vertical lines are undefined. All vertical lines are undefined. Who's the zero slope? Horizontal. So the undefined slopes are all vertical. The zero slope is a horizontal. Negative slope, decrease from left to right. Positive slopes, increase from left to right. So that's what this first question is about. What does it look like? Does it look like a positive slope, a negative slope, a zero slope, or an undefined slope? Here's the cool part about this. When you get down here for state the slope, if you're zero or undefined, you just stated it. So what's the slope of this line? Undefined. So down here, you would write D and E. What if I chose a zero slope up here? What would the answer to part B be? Zero. The only ones that you actually have to figure out the slope is when it was positive and negative. So if you tell me it's undefined, then that means the slope is undefined. Because it's a vertical line. All vertical lines are undefined. Because what's happening, if you ran the slope formula for this, you would end up taking a number divided by 0. We just talked about that. That's an error. But as a slope, it means undefined. Cool beans? All right, moving on. 15. So here, it's kind of like that one that we did earlier with the negative 3. They wanted you to plug it in. But that's when they gave you an equation. OK? Here, they're giving you a graph. So again, who does this negative 2 represent? x. So go to the x-axis, find negative 2. Here it is. So this is negative 2, right? Where is the graph at? At a positive 2. It's right here. That's the answer to the problem. That's what they want to know. Given this value, where's your graph at? It's at a positive 2. Nope, it just wants the number. See, it says write the answer as an integer or decimal. It just wants the number, 2. Find that number. That's right. And that's the answer. Because they're giving you the x value here, right? This positive 2 is the y value. So basically what they're telling you, even though they didn't write it out, they're telling you x is negative 2. Who's y? Yeah, that is true. f of x does represent y. So all they're wanting to know is, here's my point at negative 2. What was the y value to it? And it's a positive 2. That's all that question's asking. <clears throat> Everyone good? Any questions on that one so far? OK, so the next three problems, 16, 17, and 18, these are the word problems. These are your word problems. All right, so here's 16. When I talk to my students, I told them that the word problems that are coming at you are going to be given one of two ways. They're either giving you two points, or they're giving you slope intercept. Here's the difference on how you can tell this. If you see four numbers in the problem, they're giving you two points. 
So when you look up here, how many numbers do you see? This is two points. When you see two numbers in the problem, they're giving you slope intercept. And plus, you will see a specific word. That specific word that I'm talking about is that. If you see the word per, each, or every, they're all meaning slope. That that number with that word is the slope. That is M. You see the word per, each, or every, they're telling you the slope. So they're giving you slope intercept. Answer. Is it on this review? It's on your exam. Whatever we do today is on that exam. If we're not covering it today, it ain't on there. Okay? Unless your teacher is just mean and, and puts extra stuff on there. But this is what's on the computer exam. Every. Per each and every mean slope. So also, when you look at this, even though there are four numbers, you don't see the word per each or every up here. So that's another clue that you have two points. So up here, it says, in 1972, a school had 6.2 thousand students. In 2019, the student body had grown to 15.6 thousand students. Part A says, write the equation. Part B, once you get the equation, they'll have you plug into it. So part B is just an extending question. So we need to make sure that you get part A right to help you with part B. <clears throat> so what is the first point that they're giving you? You got it. 1972, 6.2. The two numbers in the first sentence form the first point. The two numbers in the second sentence form the second point. So what's the point in the second sentence? There we go. So we are right back to that problem that we did earlier. Oh, I think it was number four. Nope, it was number five. You're right back to this guy. I told you that this would come again. Here it is. So you've got two points. All you got to do is write the equation. OK? So that was uh, number 16. Let's do this. So again, I'm just going to take the 2.5 seconds it does to do this. Who is the 1972? X1. X one. Who's the 6.2? Y1. 2019? And Y2 by process of elimination. So we're going to run our slope formula. Y2 minus Y1 all over X2 minus X1. So who's Y2? 15.6. And this is the problem where you will use decimals to help you out. You need decimal answers. Don't put it in as fractions. Okay? Plus, it says right here, whole number or decimal numbers. So they don't want fractions. And then who is your Y1? 6.2. This is the only one that you should have those decimals on. Who is your X2? Uh, X1. 1972. There you go. All right, so you go to your calculator, and I'm going to need your help for this because. I, all right, so this top one is 9.4, and then you said the bottom is 47. I'll take it. Now, did you leave that in nope. I want you to do the division. Yep. So what is 9.4 divided by 47? And it's not a long decimal. It is very, very short. Say it louder. 0. 0.2. So there's our slope. 0. 0.2. If you get some sort of long decimal on here, you've done something incorrect. So watch out for that. Well, we're not done yet, though. So you found the slope. Now we've got to write the equation. So we're going to come right back up here. 
who do you want to work with? The first point or the second point? Now, I'm going to work with this guy. A little bit smaller number there. Okay. Whenever I pick a point, I always work with the smaller of the two. So now we're going to come down here. And again, this is where you can run point slope or you can run the slope intercept formula, solve for B, and rewrite it. It's your call. So I'm going to run point slope. Y minus Y1 equals M parenthesis X minus X1. Y minus, what is Y1? 6.2. What was our slope? 0 0.2. X minus, what was our X1? Uh, I thought it was 1972. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, 1972. All right. So, all right. So, what is 0 0.2 times X? 0.2x. What is 0 0.2 times negative 1972? And you will have to have it. I can't do this in my head. I'm not that good. Are you sure on that one? times negative 1972. Hit your two. Enter. Negative 394.4. Is that what you got? All we did was multiply. And then what are we going to do now? Add 6.2. So y equals 0.2x minus what is negative 394.4 plus 6.2. <coughs> 388.4. What? 2. Okay. There's your equation. That's the answer to part A. So this, so if you did the y1 minus the y2 divided by the x1 minus the x2, you would have ended up with both of these being negative. And a negative over a negative is a positive. So that's what would have happened if you did y1 minus the y2 divided by the x1 minus the x2. So there's our equation. This is the answer to part A. So now in part B, they tell us that based on your model from above, what's the number of students attending in the year 2044? Who is 2044? That's your X. So they're telling you X is 2044. So all you have to do is plug into the X and kick out a number. That's how you deal with part B. Take that value, plug it into X, Kick me out an answer. So y equals 0 0.2 times 2044 minus 388.2. So what is 0 0.2 times 2044? What is 0 .408.8? Minus 388.2. What do we get? Say it again. 20.6. And it will provide the label for you. But just so you know, this is 1,000 students. But the label is already provided for you there. But that's it. That's how you deal with part B. Take the, the value they give you, plug it in, K 
kick out your answer. So I guarantee you, on your exam, one of your questions, they're going to give you two points. You have to write the equation and then plug into it. Okay. 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 Any questions on this? Feeling all right? Uh huh. Okay. So instead of the y and the x, your this guy becomes p. Your x is t. So in here, instead of the y and the x, it would look like this. P, T. Yeah, good observation. Because if you put y and x in the answer, we'll mark it wrong. Make sure that you definitely use the variables that they're after. Good catch. Because in my notes, all I put was y and x. But yeah, definitely. Make sure if they provide you variables, use those variables. Thank you. Any other questions on number 16? All right, number 17. So in this one, we kind of already talked about this. Uh, you can see the word per. So that means they're giving you slope intercept. Who is the slope? The slope is going to be 24. Now, in this one, they didn't give us any variables, so we can go back to y and x. So y equals, you told me the slope is 24x, and then there's another number, and it says plus a flat fee. So what do we add on? Plus 39. There's your equation. There's the equation, because this was your m, and then this guy right there was the b. What are we going to do with this six hours? You got it. We're going to plug in the six, because that's who x is. So that's how we finish out the rest of this problem. y equals 24 times 6 plus 39. So what is 24 times 6? 144. And then we take 144 plus 39. 183. And in this case, this is all about dollars. But again, it will provide the label for you. So you don't have to worry about providing the label. But always, with any word problem, you should always be thinking about what that label is. You should always be thinking about what that label is. So again, another word problem they're going to give you, they're going to give you all the information for slope intercept. You need to write it and then plug into it. So they gave you everything you needed. They gave you the M. They gave you the B. Any question on number 17? I agree. Well, the M, is next to the word per. M is always next to that word per, guaranteed. If you see per, each, or every, they're telling you the slope. Mean the slope, absolutely. Everyone feeling good on 17? All right. Number 18, nice and quick. So they're giving you this information. They're giving you the equation. We don't have to make it. And it says that it is based on how many sunny days X there are during a year. Later on, it says there are 224 sunny days in a year. What are we doing with 224? Substituting it in for X. If you notice, all of your word problems, in the end, once you had your equation, you plug back into it. All they want you to do, take this 224, put it in for x, and tell me what the answer is. So c of x is equal to 280 times the 244 plus 70,000. So what is 280 times 244? 
62,720 plus 70,000 gives us what? 132,720. And again, this is all about the moolah. It's all about the cost. Feeling good? Okay. Okay. And that ends your word problems. If you can do those three, you can do the ones in the exam. Guaranteed. They will run just like that. All we're going to do is change the numbers. Don't tell anybody. All right, 19. These last two are pretty straightforward. So in 1.5, uh, I don't know the pages off the top of my head, but there are two pages where they show you a bunch of different functions. And that's all these last two questions are about, is those two pages in the book. And those pages are, because she's got her famous book for me. Keep going. Page 56 and 57. That's where these last two questions live. Page 56 and 57. I'll put that over here on the board. That's what question 19 and 20 are going to be about. Page 56 and 57. So this question right here, it wants you to take a look at this picture and it wants to know which function is it. Is it linear? A quadratic, a square root function, a cubic function, a cube function, reciprocal function, absolute value function. So it's taking a look at that page 56, 57, and identifying which picture it is. Now, for your exam, obviously, you're going to have to know what these guys look like. But for this one, the answer is reciprocal. That is the reciprocal function. That's all this question wants to know. What function is it? Look at that page 56, 57, and it identifies that information for you. But again, when it comes time for your exam, you're going to need to know that. Okay. Question number 20. It's giving you this function right here, and it wants to know what buttons would you push in the calculator to graph it. Again, that's on page 56 and 57. It tells you what buttons to push on a TI-84 to graph the function. Page 56 and 57, it tells you what buttons to push. Okay? So the first thing you're going to do if you want to graph is push what? Y equals. Because you want to graph. So you got to go into Y equals first. That is step one. All of these begin out with pushing y equals. So when you're looking at this, I want to graph. So in order to graph, if you push graph, it doesn't work. There's nothing there because you haven't told it what to graph. Your calculator is always going to play dumb with you. So you've got to tell it what to do. That's why you push y equals. And it's in here that you put your equation. So our equation was x cubed. So what do we got to push next? you got to push the x. you got to put the x in. So where's our x button? It's right next to alpha. Okay? So the second step is to push x. So when I'm looking at my one notebook here, which step are they telling us to do? A. So step two is A, because you got to put x in there. And then, remember, we want x cubed, right? How do I put an exponent in on my calculator? That's right, that little hat. It's right above the division symbol. I call it the rooftop, okay? Because it looks like a rooftop, but also the hat. So you push that, and look, it goes up into the exponent. And what's our exponent? Three. So which step was that that they just did? It was B. We push the rooftop, and then we push 3. And now it looks like my function, right? It looks like x cubed. So what do you do to look at the graph? 
Press graph. And there she be. There it is. Press graph. So our last step then in here was which one? E. Press graph. So this step right here, C, was junk. There will be one step in there that is complete junk. Okay? So there it is. D-A-B-E. Dabe. Okay? And then the second question, you just need to look at that graph and figure out which one it is down below. That's what the next question is all about. So they want to know which one of these graphs was the x cubed. So here's the graph. There's what it looks like. It starts down below and works its way up. So which graph is that? B. Done. That's your exam. Thanks for joining me.